Turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. We were in Acts chapter 3 two weeks ago, and we're going to look at the same story this morning, but we're going to flip it. You know, when you look at a jewel or something, they, they, there's different facets, right? There's different angles, and the more you look at it and turn it, you get it from a... Listen, we can take Scripture, and we can turn it, and we can twist it, we can look at it from a different light, and we can find a lot of different truths from it. So we're going to use the Scripture this morning that we were in in Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. We're going to walk through that to help us understand the, the context of what I'm talking about this this morning. Now the title that you see up there is Two Broke Witnesses and I hope I, can, I hope I can wrap a rope around that and pull that in and you'll understand where that comes from, what that means. It's simple from the text but I hope I can relate that to each one of us and what it means for us. Now as the Lord, before the Lord ascended, as he went back into heaven, Matthew 28, 18, 19, 20, we get the great, the great commission where we're commissioned to go out and make disciples. In Matthew 28, 18, uh, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Thank you, Cami. That's what the call she's answered. It's, it's a call that's no different for any of us. Now, we may not be called to go to Thailand, but we're called to go. And the word there, it, the go there is to as you are going. It's as you're living life, as you're going through life. And so go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So we are to go. As we are going, we are to make disciples. None of us are exempt from that. Every one of us, if we are a born-again believer, we have that call on our life, that commission on our life, really that commandment on our life to go. This wasn't a, hey, if you feel like it, go. No, the Lord said go. As you're going through life, make disciples, minister to people. And so when we think about that, we think about ministering to people, we think about sharing it, we think about the word ministry. Wouldn't that be a word that would come to mind? We think about ministry. And so what I want to share with you this morning in the brief time I have is, is a definition of ministry because sometimes we don't know what that, what, what does that really mean? What does ministry mean? What does that word mean? What, how do we, how would we define ministry? Well, I like when there are people smarter than me, which is most people. So it's not hard for me to find people smarter than me, but when I find someone who, who really simplifies something, I love that. Now I love Warren Wearsby. If any of you listen to read Warren Wearsby, uh, he's just right down the middle. I, I, I've, I've very rarely found things I disagree with him on. Uh, that makes him really smart, right? So he disagree, he agrees with me. No, he's just, uh, he's a, he's a, a recent, I think in the last year, year and a half, maybe it's been that he passed. And so just a great theologian of our day, great preacher in our day, he, can, he has a great definition for ministry. And he says this, that ministry takes place, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. That, he says, is when ministry takes place. And so there's a lot of things that we see that people call ministry. Can I tell you, going to Africa and boring whales in itself is not ministry? You know, because, because you can go b b get people clean water, and I'm all for getting people clean water. But when we talk about gospel ministry, there has to be a gospel involvement in that. And so it's not just, just everything that we want to do doesn't necessarily mean it's ministry, okay? So there's some things in here that fall in line. So I want you to see, let's go to Acts chapter 3. We're going to read this real quick, uh, verses 1 through 11. And again, looking at the story we looked at two weeks ago. Now, Peter and John went up together to the, the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. So it's about three in the afternoon. They're making their way up to the temple for, to go for prayer. Verse 2, And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of those who entered the temple. So basically, in our context today, he's a beggar. He's, he, he can't walk. His only means, way of, of, of providing for himself is to beg. So his family, someone has carried him his whole life. They carry him there. They carry him to the gate outside of the temple. What better place? People are coming up. They're going to go worship God. Hopefully, they're going to be generous with some money. They're going to give him something. And they lay him, they set him at that gate, and he's sitting there. And so he's sitting there, and here come Peter and John. So this man who's seen Peter and John, about to go into the temple, asked for alms, asked for a handout, asked for benevolence, asked for love, asked for some, just some compassion. Give, us, give me something so I can buy food for myself today. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. He says, look at us. 
So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. So the man, well, somebody spoke to me. Peter, Peter speaks to him. Look at us. So he looks up and he's like, wow, they're going to give me something. They might say something, but they're going to give me something. Verse 6, then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Nazareth rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who had healed, who, who, who was healed held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So that's the story. And so I want us to look at this story as a picture of ministry. And then let's look at this definition and see how this fits into it. Now, ministry takes place when divine resources we look at verse 6 there it says then Peter said silver and gold I do not have but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth rise up and walk now how many of us could say that now I don't know if we could truly say today that we're silver and gold I do not have because we're, we're we, you know the poorest of the poor in America are among the richest in the world we're still wealthy but the fact is if I'm going to rest on the silver and gold what little bit I may have I, I don't have much to do for anybody and what can I really what can I really do to help somebody listen there are there are are more needs than we can name, right? There's more things that 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 are that that are needed to be helped with. But here's the fact. Here's what we're wanting to what we're wanting to try to do it, it is ministry takes place when divine resources. Silver and gold, now the Lord may have blessed me with silver and gold, but that's not necessarily divine resource. Divine resource is something that comes from God, His grace, His mercy. Now, He can minister to us in a lot of different ways. and We're going to see that coming forward. But mercy and grace and love and forgiveness and healing, these are the kind of things that come from God. These are divine resources. Now, money could be a gift from God. and it may, I'm not saying that would never be the case. But, I, but I've said this before. I said this recently. Sometimes we throw money at issues. We throw money at issues way too quick. Because God may be doing a work in, in a situation and we want to fix the symptom real quick. The symptom is the need for some money. The problem is why did we get to that place? So maybe some, not some biblical principles being, proper, but being followed. Maybe there, there's a lot of biblical principles, but principles not being followed. So we want to get to the, that core of the, the divine resources. Now, what has God given me? God's given me life. He's given me strength. He's given me knowledge of the gospel. That knowledge of the gospel is that's a, that's what God has poured into my life are the things that I can pour into others' lives, divine resources. So think about gifts from God, things that come from God that then maybe we can give to others, we can minister to others. others. So ministry takes place when divine resources, resources that are divine, they're from God, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs. We go back to verse 2. That certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called beautiful. This man, this man had a human need. Right? He had a human need. He was, he was paralyzed. He could not walk. That wasn't, that wasn't going to change. There was nothing he could do. There was nothing medicine could do. He was lame. He could not do anything for himself. Someone had to pick him up and carry him. Now look, there are, there, there are a lot of human needs. Right? There are, we, we, I couldn't even name them all. Even in this room, when we start talking about the needs in our own lives, right? It's, it's, it's innumerable, all the different needs that we have. Well, here, here's, here's a guy begging for some money. He just wants something to buy food that day. Peter and John come along, and he, what does Peter say? I, I don't have any money. Silver and gold we don't have. There's the two broke witnesses. Could have called it two broke preachers. They didn't have any money. They're coming along, and he's going, hey, man. Look, I ain't, I ain't got any silver or gold. I know that's what you want and you want me to give you. I don't have that. But what I do have, what I do have are these divine resources. What I do have is what God would give you, what God may give you through me, what God would give you, these divine resources. These, these I'll be glad to give you. Folks, there are a lot of human needs. But ultimately, what is the ultimate need that every human being has? Needs Jesus. 
There's the, it's the need for salvation. It is, that is the need we all have from birth. We need to be born again. Folks, we, and we can go, and there's a lot of things we could do to help people. Going back to water, we can go put wells in, in Africa. That's a great thing. We used to, when we were doing mission work over in Tajikistan and stuff, we would go into a village and we'd build, we'd build onto a school or we'd help with a children's home. We'd go from house to house. Their, their houses there weren't insulated. Their windows were generally knocked out. We'd go buy pane glass, big old sheets of pane glass with a, with a cutter, and we would cut glass to fit in their windows and tack it in with just little tacks that would hold the glass in just to keep wind from blowing into their house. You know why we did that? We did that so we'd have an opportunity to sit down with them and give them the gospel. We wouldn't go, well, if you'll trust Jesus, we'll fix your window. No, that's, that's manipulation. It ain't going to work. They'll lie to you or whatever. So we'd go in and minister to people. We meet the human need. We would look to meet the human need with those divine resources, with what God is doing. So ministry takes place when divine resources, resources from God, meet human needs. Ultimately, that need is for salvation uh, through loving channels. And there's two parts to that, and we've talked a lot about this. Loving channels. We need to, we need to speak the truth in love. We need to go out in love as we minister to people. We should, we should be, be driven by love primarily for a love for God, but that love for God ought to give us a love for other people. So we ought to be loving channels. Now, what does that mean, this channel? Well, a channel is something that things flow through. It's a, it's a, a, a good word for that might be a conduit. We should be loving conduits. Right? We should, his grace should be able to flow through us. His mercy should be able to flow through us. It is his divine resource coming through us as a loving channel. And I've shared this illustration before, and those who've been at Israel, your mind will immediately go to this. But the Jordan River starts way up north uh, above the Sea of Galilee, and it flows down and it flows into and then through the Sea of Galilee. Well, it flows through there. So the Sea of Galilee ultimately is a, it's a conduit that the river flows through, that grace flows through. And you know what you find? It is teeming with life. There's fishing boats out there, and they're casting their nets, and they're pulling fish up, and it's just full of life. There's life all around the lake. And then the, the river flows on out, and it goes further south in the country, and it goes down, and it flows into the Dead Sea. Now, it got its name because there's so much life down there. No, it's dead. They call it the Dead Sea because it is the Dead Sea. It's like seven times saltier than the, than the ocean. You get in there and you float. You're like a cork. You just, you just bob in the water. You, you cannot sink. You try to and you can't. It's even hard to stand up when you get to a certain level in there. It's dead, and it's dead because it's, it's just a reservoir. It runs in, and nothing runs out. So everything gets in there, it just dies. So it is not, it is not a conduit. It's not a channel, and, it, and, it, and it's dead. Now, here's the other thing about a channel. If we're going to be loving channels, we're loving channels. We're loving distributors. Things flow through, okay? So we want to be a distributor. Now, as Christians, we should be distributors of God's grace not manufacturers of God's grace. Can anybody in here manufacture God's grace? I can't. If, we, if you want to see a great illustration of this, you could, you could turn over to Matthew 14, and we see the, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And in Matthew 14, you get to verse 16, and they had come to Jesus and said, send them away, they, they need to go get food, they don't have anything to eat, it's a long way to get home. And, and, and the Lord said, uh, they don't need to go away, you feed them. And, you know, I've shared this before, but basically there, I think the Lord was, was teaching them a point. He said, you feed them. You, they're not, they don't need to go away. You feed them. Well, they'd already looked. They don't have enough money to feed them. They don't have enough silver and gold to feed them. They don't have any way. And so they're looking around, and then they finally come to the end of themselves. Oh, I can't do it. Well, we got this, some little boy heard what was going on. He comes up, brings a sack lunch, and brings that. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. All right, so we got these five little loaves and two fish. Wow, what a, that's great. And they finally go to the Lord give up on trying to do it themselves. They realize, I can't do it. And they go to the Lord and say, Lord, we, 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 don't, we can't do it. All we got is these five loaves and two fish. That's it. How can we feed them? And the Lord said, good. That's exactly where I want you to be. That's where instead of you trying to make it happen and you trying to do it in your own power, I'll do it. So if you go to, I think it's in Mark, it says the Lord already knew what he was going to do. He, already, he knew what he was going to do. He had a plan in this. 
So it, this didn't catch him off guard. Oh boy, how am I going to feed these people? What am I going to do? No. And so we see the story there in Matthew 14. And, it, and then in verse 17, it says, And they said to him, We have here only two, uh, five loaves and two fishes. So they, he said, Bring them here to me. The principle is, whatever you have, bring it to the Lord. Give it to him. Verse 19, then he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass. Again, the Lord is a God of order, not of disorder. He has them sit down on the grass. And he took the five loaves and the two fishes. He took, and looking up to heaven, look what he did. He blessed. He blessed it. Five loaves, two fishes. And he broke. He blessed it. He broke it. And he gave the loaves to the disciples, and the disciples gave to the multitudes. The Lord blessed it, the Lord broke it, and as he began to distribute it, as he began to multiply it, he gives it to the disciples. Now, what do the disciples do? Do they go sit down in a corner and eat it and hog it up? And, oh, well, there's not much here. I'm gonna... No, what did they do? They share it. They, they, as, he, as he multiplies it and he's giving it to them, they go and they distribute it to the people. So what are they being? They're being loving channels of God's grace. They couldn't make it happen. There was nothing they could do on their own. There's nothing they could do there to, to make that happen. It was only through him. So, folks, that's what we need to be, is, is loving channels of his grace. Too many times we, we get caught up in trying to make it happen. Oh, I want to make this happen a certain way. I want this to, you know, you know what? Pastor Aaron, and I'm sure he and I do the same thing. We pray about this, and, and we, we're led. We want to, Lord, I want to be used. I want you to use the service, Lord, but I can't make anything happen in here. I, I, anybody that walks through those doors that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray they would get saved. That day, I want that. But I can't change a heart. All I can do is try to be obedient, to be, to be a loving channel of God's grace, of His divine resources. And, and let those resources then meet the human need. So ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels. And the last part of this is to the glory of God. Verse 8, so he leaping up stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate. Uh, here's what they saw. They saw a life that had been changed. They praised God because they saw this man praising God. As, as Peter and John are just, they're just loving channels of God's divine resources. And when they let the, the resources, the divine resources, God's grace, His mercy, His healing, when they just allowed themselves to be channels of His grace, they were able to touch Him. And when they touched Him, His legs were healed. I mean, He didn't just like, it wasn't like some 30 seconds to get, oh, to get, no. I mean, it was like, boom, He was healed. He, and He jumped up. He didn't say made His way up and like a new baby horse, you know, when they, 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 they take them a little bit to get up. Up, you know, and they finally get up on their feet. No, he instantly had strength and he's up. He jumped up. He leaped up. And then he's running. And I mean, he's like in full strength. All they did was just humble themselves to be used of God. And they were a loving channel for his grace to go through. And they let the grace go through them and to heal that man. All for the glory of God. Not for Peter's glory, not for John's glory, for, for, for God's glory. That's when ministry takes place. So what do we do? We, we, that was two broke witnesses. Anybody out there relate? I don't care how much money you have in the bank. We're just, we're just broke witnesses. That's what we are. We're just broke witnesses. If we'll just humble ourselves before the Lord, say, Lord, I, I want to be used of you. We'll just be a humble servant of the Lord. We're just broke. We realize that. And we go, you know what? Silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I'll give you. I got love. I got time. I got an ear. I got, I got some wisdom. I got some words of knowledge for you. I've got some, I got some scripture for you. I can pray with you. Man, I can, I, I, whatever, whatever I can do to help you, I'm going to give you the gospel because it's the greatest thing you need right here. We just be loving channels of God's divine resources 
and allow God to meet those human needs. Because, folks, he wants to minister to, through us. Amen? I have more, but I have 10 seconds. <laughs> and I'm going to be a man of my word. Uh-oh. It's on silent. It is going off. All right. All done. 20 minutes. I got it. I got it. Once in five and a half years, praise the Lord. <laughs> Listen, we are, we, are, we, are to, we are to glorify God. Amen. Amen. That ought to be the goal of our lives is to bring glory to God. Um, these two guys, man, these two, these two men, these two broke witnesses, you know, they didn't have silver or gold. They didn't have a lot of money. But what they had, that they had what God had given them, what God had shared with them, how he had loved them. And, 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 and they were willing to share that. They were given to give it to others. And uh, that's what we need to do. If we want to have impactful ministry, if we want to make a difference in people's lives, look, ministry takes place when divine resources meet human needs through loving channels to the glory of God. Now, we're going to receive, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. We're going to take communion. And uh, so we're going we're to have a time for you to prepare uh, because you, you, you need to prepare your hearts for this. And so uh, I'm going I'm to share some scripture in preparation of this. And then we're going to have, uh, Jim, if you want to come on up, you, you can come on up now, Pastor Aaron. Uh, we'll have this part in preparation. Then they're going to play. If our deacons want to come on up, that would be fine. If you want to make your way up here to the front and prepare, uh, they'll, they'll serve us here in a moment. But I, wanna, I want us to, to, to read some verses in preparation, preparing our hearts uh, for this time. And I'll say, I'll say this as we prepare. In, in, uh, in 1 Corinthians, when we look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, I believe it is. Yeah, when, we, when we're there and we see this where the Lord instituted or, or Paul at least is writing about the, the night that the Lord instituted this. The Lord says this, and Paul writes this in verse 27. It says, Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So as we take part in this, I'll say this up front. Uh, we, we observe open communion here, which means you don't have to be a member of our church, but, but you do need to be a born-again believer. And uh, I, I'm not, we're not going to come around and look for a stamp on your hand or anything like that. We're not doing that. You, you, you know whether you have truly trusted Christ or not. There's a strong warning for, for someone who takes part in this because it's, it, it's belittling really what, what the Lord did for us. It's almost us lying if we say, well, yeah, I'm a believer. The other thing is... If, if we're not in a place spiritually where we need to be, there's some, there's some danger in that. If you read on past that, there were those who took it in an unworthy way, and some, some were, they slept, which is the Bible way of saying they died. Others were sick because they, they took in an unworthy way. So the challenge right now, what we want to do in preparing our hearts for this, is am I walking with the Lord? Am I where, where I need to be with the Lord? And so I, we, we want to we prepare our hearts in that as we reflect on what the Lord did for us. What the Lord did for us. When he went to the cross of Calvary, when his body was broken and his blood was shed for us. Now, uh, Cliff, did you tell me Isaiah 53 yesterday? All right, so I'm, I'm going to do this in honor of, of uh, Pastor Darrell. I'm trying not to get emotional. Um, I don't know that we've had communion since Pastor Darrell passed, uh, but Cliff was telling me yesterday, we were here for the service, and he was telling me, he said he didn't think that Pastor Darrell ever did communion without reading or at least referencing Isaiah 53. And so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to read through Isaiah 53 in preparation, preparing our hearts for, for this, and then we'll have a time to reflect uh, an invitation time we're going to play. I'm going to ask you this morning that Pastor Aaron would just, just, uh, you just sing and, and do. And I want you to sit in silence and in prayer right, and in preparation for this, okay? Isaiah 53, verse 1. Who has delivered our report? I'm sorry, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. 
And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And he hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our, for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And, then, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord God laid on his son Jesus, on him, the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is silence, silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the, the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. Praise be to our God. Father, as we, as we come to this time now in our service uh, of observing communion, the observing the Lord's Supper, this, in, this, this ordinance that the Lord on the last night on earth, he instituted this, this memorial as we remember, as he tells us to remember his body, which is broken for us, to remember his blood, which he would shed for us. And as he told those disciples, uh, they, they had to have struggled with even what he was really saying or what he was meaning because he spoke before the events. They didn't understand the body broken at that point. They didn't understand, but they would understand in just hours. They would understand what he was saying. But Lord, as we look back, we clearly see, we absolutely know, we have full, full uh, clarity and vision of, of what went on that night and what went on the next day. As you, Lord Jesus, you went to that, you, you, you took the beating for us. A beating with a cat of nine tails. You were humiliated and spit upon and your beard was plucked. And they put a, they put a crown of thorns on your head. They did all they could to humiliate you and shame you and mock you. And you defended not yourself. You spoke not a word. You bore your cross to the Mount of Calvary. And you laid on that cross and you took our place on that cross. And you were nailed to that tree where you hung and you died for us. Your blood shed. All along that journey, your blood was shed. The precious, sinless blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I just pray right now that as we think on what you did for us, May we think about how we're living now for you. Lord, if there's sin in our life, if there's anything that needs to be confessed, I pray right now we'll confess that and get that right with you. If there's something that we need to get right with someone else that's in this room, we'll get that right with you and with them. Lord, if we need to come to this altar and just have a time of humility and repentance and, and brokenness, Lord, then I pray that you'll move on hearts and folks will move to this altar. Lord, I pray right now you'll prepare us for what we're about to observe as we remember the Lord's Supper. In Jesus' name we pray.